Those who are in the back are welcome to move up. There are a couple of spots as the hour gets late and the snow gets deeper. If you don't know what I'm talking about with the snow, there's no snow, don't worry about it, we're fine. We're doing just fine. Okay, people have, have the sheets. Welcome to Eicha. When, uh, you know, when, we, when we posted the sponsorship opportunities, no one wanted to sponsor Eicha. <laughs> I can't say I blame them, <laughs> especially because my title is Eicha, a guide for grieving. <laughs> it's not like that's you know, an enticing uh, uh, title. Um, I want to once again thank, I mentioned it earlier on, but I want to thank Yeshivat Archaim for uh, allowing us to have the program here today in our home Beit Midrash, uh, as well as Shari Shemayim for providing the Tanakhs and the Herzog School in Israel for providing the bookmarks uh, that uh, the people should really take advantage of. They they're provide a handy timeline for Tanakh. Eicha, or as it's known in the Gemara, the book of Keynote. Right? If you take a look at source number one, I brought you the Gemara and Baba Basra as one example. When it talks about the order of the books that are found in Ketuvim, it says, Sidran Shak Ketuvim, the order of Ketuvim is Rut, then Tehillim, which is interesting in its own right, not for the discussion right now, but they have Rut first. Um, Rut, Tehillim, Iov, Mishlei, Kohelet, Shirashirim, Kinot, Daniel, Esther, Ezra, Dibri, Ayamim. So Echa doesn't appear on the list because it is... He knows. The order, yes, the order on this list is a chronological order, right? Ruth would logically have to be before Tehillim, since we associate Tehillim with David. Eov, no one really knows when Eov happened anyway. That Gemara that I referenced when we taught the Eov, uh, when we discussed Eov, has a, a range of views as to when Eov takes place, if he took place at all, right? Then you have Mishle Kohelet Shir Hashirim, Shlomo's uh, triumvirate, followed by Eicha, leading us into exile, Daniel in exile, um, Esther in exile, and then uh, Ezra and, uh, and Deborah Hayyamim. But I just brought that just to show you that this book is known as Keynote, and what does Keynote mean? Lamentation. lamentation, wailing. It is a book of crying. When they translate Eicha as lamentations, right, they're not translating the word Eicha. The word Eicha basically means how. Right? How, how come, why, whatever spin on the question you want to put. Lamentations is actually a translation of the Gemara's title. The, uh, the title being the book of Keynote. It initiates wailing for our suffering. And it's wailing as a response to suffering as opposed to pure apology. Right? Wailing in the sense of turning to God and saying, how could this have happened? We are so miserable. As a matter of fact, Rav Soloveitchik used to say when he spoke on Tisha B'av, that Yirmiyahu is the author of Eichel. We're going to talk about that. And his act of wailing is a heter for us. It licenses us to do that. Because otherwise, I might have said, by what right do you complain to God about your suffering? If God is punishing you, you did something wrong, stop crying about it and fix things. But the fact that your Miyahu is able to do this is what provides uh, the right for us to wail as well. That was what Reb Soloveitchik used to say, and he said that was, the, that was the license for us to do so at night on Tisha B'av. And then the next day, when you have the Haftorah, which comes from your Miyahu, and he says, call the Makona note, call the women who will cry, it's the same thing. That's the heter. That's what gives us the right to, to say keynote ourselves. Structure of the book is as I put it on your sheet in number two. It's a five-chapter book. The first, second, and fourth chapters run with the basic alphabetical order, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, right? The order of the, uh, the psukim with the notable switch of the pei and ayin. The um, chapter three is the triple alphabet. So you have three sentences of Aleph, three sentences of Bet, three sentences of Gimel. You get the idea. Um, and then chapter five has 22 verses. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, although it's not an alphabetical acrostic. 
But the, um, the, in terms of the outline of what's happening within the book, your first two chapters describe suffering and isolation with increasing, intensifying force, which we're going to come back to. Chapter 3 brings God more into the conversation about what has happened as we speak to God and God speaks to us. And chapters 4 and 5, we reflect on our guilt, we reflect on our suffering, and it ends with anticipation of redemption. Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Venoshuva. Okay. Alphabetical structure, what does it do? Why do we have an alphabetical structure in Echa? What's the idea? To atone for the sins that we committed with the letters of the alphabet. Could be. The Dat Mikra introduction is, is straightforward. He suggests it's simply good for memory. Right? For people who are going to learn this, if it's, if it's done that way, it's easier to, uh, to memorize. But more, it shows also that the pain and the desolation which are described here encompass everything in the universe. Aleph to Tav, as the expression would go. Beginning to end of the alphabet, that's the, the suffering that we're, that we're having. So the arc of the book, as I said, we start out by describing suffering and isolation, and many of the expressions seen in chapter one intensify in chapter two. So for example, if you have the, uh, the stone Tanakh, if you take a look on page 1717, chapter one, sentence two, Bachosiv kebalayla, right? She cries at night. Vidimasa alechia, her tears are on her cheek. Ein la menachem mikolo avah, she has no one to comfort her from all those who uh, who had loved her before. So she's described as uh, as crying. She's described as crying at night, which has a certain intensity to it in its own right. No one will comfort her. Her friends have abandoned her. They've become enemies. Now take a look at chapter 2, sentence 11, which also describes crying. It's on the next page. They sit on the ground. I'm sorry, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted Pasuk Yedah, sentence 11. My eyes, kalu, kalu vayichulu, right? They're finished. My eyes fail as they translate it here. They end with tears. Chamar meru mei, my innards, as they translate here, burn. Nishpach lo aretz kvedi, my liver spills out on the ground. I'll shever bat ami because the daughter of my nation is broken. It's much stronger. It's more intense. The expressions in chapter one come back with greater intensity in uh, in chapter two. The dot mikra edition does more to show this line by line. Then we shift to speak about how Hashem punishes those who sin, and we have the elements of calling to God and God responding, as I mentioned, before we describe our guilt. The book is a study in grief. And one of the things that highlights that, one of the phenomena literarily that highlight that, is the speaker. If you look at the verses, if you look at the psukim in Eicha, who is speaking? Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is speaking. Where do you see that? No, no, look at it. Who speaks in this book? So, somebody who is miserable is speaking in the first person, at least in that line that David just mentioned, the line that we saw from chapter 2. My innards burn. Is that the only speaker? Third person. Right, the beginning of the book is third person. Bachosiv kebalayla, right? She cries at night. There are actually a couple on the table behind you. You can take them there also. The, um, she cries at night. It is a third person observer. And not only that, but you also find second person. You find somebody addressing the nation directly. All of these different points of view are present to describe the grief that is going on. It begins with the third person. Then it has Yerushalayim speak about herself, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. In chapter 2, we talk about the suffering of the nation as a third-person observer. And then we go back to speaking personally. Chapter 3, the individual speaks about his own suffering and that of the nation around him, largely in the first person. Then chapter 4 goes back to being an outside observer before switching into the first person. We want to get this sort of 360 view of the grief experience. 
And here's something interesting about the way it intensifies when you do the first person. The Chama Leibowitz was very big on the, uh, the envelope structure. The idea that when you look at a section in Tanakh, you can find often that the beginning and the end of the section will have certain parallels, and then the second line and the penultimate line will have parallels, and you work your way inward until you get to what's in the middle, which is what you're trying to highlight with a structure like that. And, the, uh, and take a look, a few people have noted this regarding, regarding what happens in chapter one. I put it on your sheet in source number three, just to show you the way this works. Chap- it's, it's all in chapter one. Sentence one, Rabati Bagoyim, right? The city that had been great among the nations. The last sentence in the chapter, Rabot Anchotai, my sighs, my moaning are great. Using the same term, and then in sentence two, we said, Ein la menachem. There is no comforter. There is no menachem for her. And the next to last sentence, Ein menachem li. There is no menachem for me. Sentence three. Korod fei sigua bein hamitzarim. The, the pursuers caught her bein hamitzarim. Right? Bein hamitzarim in dire straits, as they translate it here. And then if you look at the third to last sentence, Ki tsarli, mitzarim tsarli. It is narrow, the place, the space is narrow for me. I am in pain. Sentence four, kohaneha, the fourth last sentence, kohanai, it's trying to move towards the middle. What is in the middle? So Rabbi Yitzhak H. Shalom points out sentence nine, which he believes is the, co- is the point here. Even though it's not the true mathematical middle of the chapter, that's okay, because after all, it's an even-numbered you know, set of sentences, so there is no true middle, right? 10 and 11, maybe. The, um, but take a look at number nine, at sentence nine in it. So the sentence that starts, Tumata bishuleha, we're on 1717. Tumata bishuleha, lo harisa, she does not remember her End, meaning she doesn't think about her end, where things are going. Vatered pilaim. She descends, how do they translate it? Astonishingly, okay. Ein menachem la, there is no one to comfort her. Re'e Hashem es onyi ki igdilo yev. God, you should see my suffering. The sentence was third person. Now it's first person. Transitions in mid-sentence. And it goes back and forth like that in the middle of this chapter. It's trying to highlight that first-person experience as Yerushalayim speaks for herself. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to show as we go through the, uh, as we go through this chapter. So what we're getting here is an image of grief. What we're getting here is an image of suffering from multiple points of view. But the main point that I want to address here is what's the point of this book? What is this book about? Why is this book here? Ketuvim in general are marked by two things, probably more than two, but the two that I am familiar with that I want to bring to bear here. There are two elements about Ketuvim which mark them as different from Navi. The writings are different from the prophets. Number one is in the Rambam here in source number four. The Rambam writes... With this sort of Ruach HaKodesh, which he had described previously, we actually talked about this passage from the Rambam in one of the other uh, other classes, but with this sort of Ruach HaKodesh, this divine inspiration, David composed Tehillim, Shlomo composed Mishlei, Kohelet, Shir Hashirim, Daniel and Eov and Dibre Hayamim, and the rest of the Ketuvim were composed with this Ruach HaKodesh, and this is why they are called written. They were written with Ruach HaKodesh, as opposed to Navi. Navi is prophecy. It is a higher level of communication with God. Ketuvim, the writings, that's a lower level. That's something that's divine inspiration. Hashem sends some kind of inspiration to the person, but there is no message being conveyed. That's one point in terms of what what marks Ketuvim, is that it's Ruach HaKodesh, it's a lower level than Navi. But there's another difference. Where does the word Navi come from? What is the, what's the root of the word Navi? Niv. Niv, is. Niv Sfatayim. Speech. Speech of the lips. Expression of the lips. That's one explanation. Another standard explanation is Navi is Lehavi. 
to bring. Either way, the prophets, Nevi'im, are spoken messages that are meant to be declared for an audience. They're meant to be declaimed. The prophet is supposed to stand up on a soapbox somewhere and shout the message to the masses. Yirmiyahu, Yeshayahu, Yechezkel, all the Treyasar Nevi'im we read about. They're supposed to proclaim something to the world. That's not what Ketuvim are. Ketuvim are written. They're not actually meant necessarily to be declared aloud. Rather, they are meant to be written and for that message to then be read by an audience later. When we get to Daniel later, for those who will still be here when we, when we do Daniel, I'm going to talk about there, there's a classic debate as to whether Daniel is a Navi or not. The Gemara says Daniel is not a Navi. It says Daniel is a Chacham. And almost everybody agrees with that. A Barbanel characteristically disagrees and says, no, he's a Navi. But why is the world so sure that Daniel is not a Navi? Like, why can't he be a Navi? And the answer is, when you read the book, you find out. He doesn't talk to anybody. He explains dreams for kings, but he doesn't, he's never given a message and told, convey it. Just the opposite. He's actually given a message and told, seal this up. Don't let anybody hear this because it's a bad idea. The, um, it's just the opposite. Daniel is not a, uh, a Navi. This, that's, that's the characteristic of Ketuvim. But here that means Hashem is inspiring Yirmiyahu to write this for some purpose. Someone is going to have to read this. And there's something that they're supposed to gain. And the question is, what is the reader supposed to gain by reading this book? And in order to address this, I'm going to ask the question of, what is the point in general of reading books that are in Tanakh? After all, we're at our, I don't even know at this point, right? Sheer number 15 or 16 or something like that. At some point, 16, thank you, David. The, um, at some point, we should know what we gain by reading books that are in Tanakh. I keep talking about my relationship with God with each book. What does it do? But what do you gain out of books in Tanakh in general? What is the, what's the point? We don't know by now. We have a problem. <laughs> 70. Okay. Sorry? So some books give us history. Yes. Uh, but there are categories. Some books will give me national history, right? Those early prophets we talked about, Yoshua, Shoftim, Shmuel, Malachim, they give us history. Parts of the Nevi'ah Mahronim, right? We get stories that show up in these prophets as well as parts of Ketuvim. Ruth had a story. Esther has a story. We get history. Then you have a Tehillim, right? Tehillim has many different components to it, but at least one of them is Tefillah, it's prayer. It's providing examples for how we approach God. Not exclusively, there's more, right? You had Rabbi Zirin Shir on Tehillim, but that's one of the key things that's going on in Tehillim. Some of them are predictions of future events. Yeshaya, right? We talked about that when I spoke about Yeshaya. He tells you, here's what's going to happen. Yirmiyahu. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> a little bit of different tone when you deal with him. The um, parts of Daniel are like that as well, even if we don't understand them. Some books give you advice. Mishlei gives you advice. Koheles gives you advice. <laughs> so what's Eicha? Is there any history in this book? It's, a, it's, a, it's a vehicle for expression. Vehicle for expression. I'm going to come back to that because I need to wait another 10 minutes. Like, no. The, uh, <laughs> it's a good thought. I, wanted, I, wanted, I want to frame it. The author's uh, direct experience. The author's direct experience. All right, so we're going to go to the expression now. The, um, yes, meaning there's no history in this book. It doesn't tell us anything about what happened in the Chorban, in the, uh, in the destruction. There's no tefillah, real tefillah in this. It's more a cry of pain. Than, uh, than prayer, although that itself can be a form of prayer. We do events that we did in the past, in the Bible, uh, the Torah, uh, we, 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 like we now know how, like the description, uh, the description of the Torah, how people right. felt, like right. some third party brought up it, and, right. and we go back, and, and we see other parts of Joshua and the spies, Right. There's an element of learning history and learning to hopefully recognize the patterns. That's, uh, that's for sure part of some of those books. That's, that's absolutely true. 
But here I think a lot of it really is the expression, as has been said by a couple of people now, the expression of the author. And here I think it's really important to reflect on what that can teach us. The author, as I've said a couple of times, is Yirmiyahu. How do I know that? The Gemara Baba Basra source is right after number four, but for some reason I uh, got lax on the numbering thing. So it's, uh, it, it's four and three quarters. The, um, the Gemara Baba Basra says, Yirmiyah Kasav Sifro, Yirmiyah wrote his own book, meaning Yirmiyahu, Sefer from Malachim, the book of kings, as well as Kinot, the book of Echa. And you can find that attested in various ways. Interestingly, the version of Eicha that appears in the Septuagint, as well as in older Aramaic Targumim of Eicha, begins with the words, and Yirmiyahu said. So it's right out there in the beginning. And Yirmiyahu said, Eicha Yashva Badad, and so on. Um, but if you take a look in Divrei Hayamim Bet, and I gave you the reference here on the sheet in number five, page 2019, as we move towards the end of the, uh, of the book here. Right? Chapter 35, sentence 25. You find, after the death of King Yoshiahu, Vayakonain Yirmiyahu al Yoshiahu. Yirmiyahu composed keynote, these elegies of mourning for Yoshiahu. As a matter of fact, it is assumed by many, particularly based on Eicha chapter 4, sentence 22, that his elegy for Yoshiahu is chapter 4 of the book of Eicha. That's actually what it, he talks about. Ruach HaPenu, Mashiach Hashem, the anointed one of God, who, was, uh, who fell as a result of the destruction of the nation. And that's one source for this idea that Yirmiyahu wrote it. Another one, Yirmiyahu, chapter 36, sentence 32. It's page 1161. In the Tanakh, take a look, please. Page 1161. You find Yirmiyahu bringing a scroll to King Yehoiakim and having it read aloud by Baruch ben Neria, his scribe. And if you see sentence 32 on that page, on page 1161, Yirmiyahu took another scroll. And he gave it to Baruch ben Nerio HaSofer. He gave it to the scribe Baruch. And he had written on it from the mouth of Yirmiyahu all of the words that were in the scroll that Yehoiakim had burned. There was a scroll which angered Yehoiakim, the king. It predicted the fall of Judea. And, the, uh, and that scroll was what was burned. But Yirmiyahu said, that's okay, I can write it again. And that's what we're talking about here. These are the keynotes of Yirmiyahu. Not only that, there are various parallels between the book of Yirmiyahu and the book of Echa. There is much shared language between them. The um, chapter 3 of Echa, Ani HaGever, where he describes his experiences, there are various experiences in chapter 3 which, mir which mirror events from Yirmiyahu's life. Those who were here for Yirmiyahu hours ago May, uh, may recall some of the highlights, right? Being, uh, being thrown in a pit, you know, being attacked by your own people, all sorts of fun Yirmiyahu had. They, um, so, the, so that Yirmiyahu is credited with authorship of the book. Well, who exactly is Yirmiyahu? Yirmiyahu is born chosen. He is special. He is born into a covenant and he is told, you are special for God. If you go back in Yirmiyahu to page 1073, the beginning of the book of Yirmiyahu. Chapter 1, sentences 5 and 6. Actually, sentences 4 and 5. I'm not sure why I did 5 and 6. The, um, oh, I see why. That's all right. Sentences 4 to 6. We'll compromise. Biterem et sarcha babeten yedati. Oh, now I know. No, that's why I did it. Okay. Biterem et sarcha babeten yedaticha u biterem teitse merechem hikdash ticha. Hashem says to Yirmiyahu, before I formed you in the womb, Yidaticha, they translate it here as I knew you, but what is Ladat often in Tanakh? To love. It's intimacy, right? It isn't just I knew who you were, Yirmiyahu. It's an intimate bond between God and his prophet before he was ever formed in the womb. Before you ever emerged from the womb, I had already dedicated you. Navila goyim nesaticha. I made you a Navi. From the very beginning, Yirmiyahu, you were destined for this. He is born into royalty. 
He is a Kohen. According to the Medrash, he is a descendant of Yehoshua and Rachav. His father, Chilkiah, might be the Kohen who in the days of King Yoshiahu found a scroll when they were refurbishing the Beis Hamikdash, a scroll that led to Yoshiahu's reforms of the, uh, of the nation. Yirmiyahu was the last great Navi, the last great prophet of the first Beis Hamikdash. And we find out in chapter 1, sentence 6, that he receives this prophecy while he is a Na'ar, while he is a youth. He hasn't even accomplished anything yet, and he's given this. Yirmiyahu is special, and his connection with God sets him apart from others. If you flip ahead to chapter 15, sentences 16 to 17, you want page 1109. The top of the page. Yermiyahu says, running low on time. Okay, I'm going to skip reading it inside. The, um, Yermiyahu says, my connection with God has set me apart from others in a negative way. My proximity to God estranges me from others, and it does. He is heavily anti-establishment for their corruption. He criticizes kings. He goes to war against prophets. He goes to war against his own family, the Kohanim of Anatot, the city of Anatot. They are his own family. They want to kill him. And he faces failure and struggle. He warns the Jews, don't follow the false prophets. They follow the false prophets. Don't make an alliance with Egypt. Don't look for e to Egypt for help against Babylon. And that's exactly what they do. Every step of the way, Yermio can write a script. Whatever it is that he says, don't do, that's what they're going to do. Whatever he says, do, that's what they are not going to do. That's the life of Yermio. He faces such hostility. They torture him. They, they make attempts on his life. His words are burned. He's exiled to Egypt in the end, and the people never listen. Even when they pledge to listen, in chapters 42 and 43 of Yirmiyahu, they pledge to listen, and then they don't. And he wants to quit, and yet he persists. And at one point he says words which actually echo Eo, which echo Job. He says, why was I born? Why am I even here? It's in chapter 20. It's worth looking at later. So here we have somebody of great closeness to God, somebody who was chosen from the beginning, someone who stood up for the little guy in the name of God and experienced the, su the suffering that Jews did and that Jews do. Ridicule, physical pain, exile. He is a Navi. He is chosen by God and he suffers like all of us. And I believe that's a really important message because it gives us a new way to understand the way prophecy works. Sometimes the message is the message, right? What the book says, that's what you're supposed to learn. Sometimes the medium is the message. Hashem chooses to give the Torah on a mountain in a wilderness that carries a message. The physical acts of prophets like Hoshea, Yechezkel, those physical actions carry a message. But sometimes the messenger is the message. Sometimes it's about who is doing the speaking. It's about the Navi. It's about himself. And in this case, I think that's what's going on. We are supposed to learn from the fact that this chosen person who descends from royalty, who God picked even before he was born, can still be tortured and can still suffer in the same way that we do. And that it's legitimate for him to have the response that he does. And to me, that's what's going on. This book is a fundamentally expressive book. You see elements of it in Tehillim also. You see elements of it in Shira Shirim and Song of Songs as well, where it's the expression by the author that really is the key. And I think maybe one point of this book is a lesson in grief. Specifically, it's for the Jews to see how Yirmiyahu, this prophet, responds to his pain and to our national pain. You see here, in the very beginning of the book, an acknowledgement of pain rather than a denial of it. Yashva Badad Ha'ir Abasi'am, the city that had had so many people around, now it's all alone. He doesn't deny it, he accepts it. And he declares, this is from God. He says outright, in Eicha chapter 2, sentence 5, he's very clear. He says, God did this to me. There's a very clear statement that it's from God that's coming. 
Actually, it's reminiscent of Kaddish to a certain extent, where the, uh, the mourner says, God's name should be elevated. There's this whole theme within Kaddish that that means that whatever it is that the mourner is suffering is something that came from God, which is a whole other discussion, but something I think worth thinking about. The, um, what is the Kaddish's, Kaddish's demanding of the mourner? There is soul searching and there is apology, right? Sadiku Hashem kifiu marisi, God is righteous, I rebelled against him. And there is reaching out to God, saying to God, will you please help? Will you please uh, assist? All of those are part of his reaction. And that, to me, is the message in the book that connects us to God. It gives each of us a path for approaching God when we suffer. To understand that it's not a matter of the, the, you're not worthy because your Mio had it happen to him. It's not a matter of you're not close to God because your Mio had it happen to him. And if he can cry out, and if he can cast blame, and if he can say, God, please help me, then it's something that we are able to, uh, to, to do as well. I look forward to doing other books that end on a happier note. It's hard to end Eicha on a, uh, on a happy note, but that's okay, because I'm just going to yield the floor to Rabbi Zeering, who is going to speak about... Kohelet. Kohelet. <laughs> the happy part will come after the next half hour. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I don't know how. I haven't been doing it. Yeah, what do you want to do? I just want to reconstruct.